Uh, hi there, good morning. Uh, my name is Felix. Next to me is Patrick. We're both from Microsoft, the company who was clever enough to give you those little cushions to put your large mobile phones on. <laughs> Doesn't really fit though, as we learned this morning. Uh, what, we, what we would like to talk about today is um, we would like to talk about Windows 8, which might not sound too interesting. Well, it's it's actually it's not for it's not for the speakers. It's rather for the camera. <laughs> but if you can't hear me, I'm I'm happy to speak up. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today is Windows 8, and the reason we're talking about it here at J and Beyond is because Windows 8 is able to to work with applications, serious applications, working with Windows APIs and the Windows kernel written in HTML5 and JavaScript. And we would just like to show you what we've done so far, uh, get some feedback, learn from you guys if that's interesting or not. And well, yeah. So can I can I just ask you, how many of you have worked with HTML5 and JavaScript before? Like seriously, probably most of you, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, I don't know, Patrick. Do you want to say anything? Do you want to start? Gosh, that looks so weird. Um, so one of the things we did in over the past years, or what we see is, is this consumerization of IT thing, which means people bring their devices to their daily business. And they used to have their apps where everything works fine and smooth. But the problem with those devices is you have different device types, right? You have Android, you have iOS, maybe Windows Phone. And um, you have also some different form factors. You have maybe a MacBook or you have a PC. The problem here is everyone is, is doing different standards. Everyone is doing different device things. Um, and so what we came up with is, is the idea that we have this devices connected by the cloud. And what the cloud really means is that what you guys do since forever because it's just a web. It's a web and in best case you have a service you can query against, but primarily it's the web. And so the question is, um, how we see the future. And uh, we think that HTML5 has some great features and some great capabilities in order to make that happen. Because when you think about it, um, for today's stuff, um, there is a lot of, of stuff going on. And here is a, a little technical overview of what we did in the upcoming version of Windows. And um, maybe want to jump right in here a little bit because um, most of you guys are familiar that uh, on Windows we run programs with C++, sure, we've done it for almost forever. We also have the chance of working with .NET. And there's a new hero, which is HTML5 and CSS. So we ported it to the platform and bring it the capabilities that you guys can work seamlessly with the technology you know and build applications on top of the Windows Core and work with Windows Core functionality. Okay, speaking of different devices, Microsoft thinks that if we build an operating system today, that maybe it's okay to have support for tablet and for PC as well. And there's different form factors we have already and different resolutions on devices. And one of the things that's most interesting is that maybe in the next two or three years, we see different kind of devices coming up. We see windows which are interactive. So you can make them dark, you can make them black, and then you have still the interaction even if the sun um, is shining through. And so this is one of the things. Or think about a car. Maybe the car itself is a computer in the future. Or think about Kinect, what you all can do with Kinect. So the question is, how does the next generation devices look like and how you want to interact with them? And so this is where we put a lot of effort in in order to make it happen. And um, when we look at that, we came up with a pretty, pretty simple idea, right? And it's, it's about a grid. And this comes all up to the resolution stuff we, we mentioned before, because the resolution is somehow very, very difficult to achieve. And in the early days in the web, you put some, some JPEGs on and then different sizes maybe. Um, you try to make it work with frames or then you use tables and divs and try to style them. So it, it was not that easy. So one of the things we came up with is, hey, let us build a grid. And um, since I know that Felix is one of the, the grid gurus within Microsoft, I just hand over to him. All right. So 
if you describe the problem that you have multiple devices and you have multiple platforms and multiple areas where your application is supposed to run, whether or not it's going to be a web application, you know, like the more serious stuff online, like Facebook, Twitter, um, the stuff Adobe has been doing, or a normal web application that's more about delivering content, like probably most of you guys are doing, like normal web magazines and content delivering sites. Um, in, in all the, you know, in this realm, we have we have quite some experience with working with different devices. We have some experience with working with different resolutions. And I think um, I've been with web development for quite some time now. And I think most of us have gone way beyond beyond the point where we're just developing for, you know, 1024 by 768. We're just way past that. And there's something coming up in the HTML5 standard. It's not really ratified yet. It's not really through, but it's the uh, HTML5 grid. Has anyone ever heard about the HTML5 grid? Because I think it's brilliant. <laughs> no one has. I like that the most. So uh, what W3C came up with is that while tables were probably not the best solution to making a layout, the core idea of describing areas to put content in wasn't that bad because it's really helpful in, in designing where content should flow, you know, how content should flow across the page. So basically, if you think about a grid, a grid comes down to just describing your whole screen area in units. In our case, it's 20 by 20 pixels and 5 by 5 pixels for a subunit. And what you can do is you can very simply align all your content on a grid. And I think maybe some of you have heard about grid solutions that actually work without the standards, like 360 CSS. 360 CSS? Someone? Pardon? Well, there are multiple ones. There's 360 as well. There's 960. It actually depends on the pixel size. That's where the name comes from. <laughs> so, the, so the base of the grid is the name. Yeah, exists as well. But 960 exists as well. Kind of depends on, on the... We have basically a 5 by 5. But yeah, so those, those frameworks are doing very similar things. They're trying to achieve that grid without using the grid. But now we have the grid in HTML5, which is quite cool because you can just you can define how your how your content aligns on that grid, and it's not really it's not about doing doing good design with with child's play. A grid has been around for quite some time. I don't know, you know, you're in Germany right now. Um, the Porsche 911 has been designed using a grid. It's down, you know, down to every single piece in that car. It's a grid. And we're doing the very same thing in applications and in websites. And it's pretty cool because if you think about it, once we have a grid, once we have ev everything in relations and not in absolute positions, that's the big part, we can easy, easily scale things. So what we can do is, I'm going show to show this to you in a minute. What we can do, we don't really care about the resolution anymore. And what's even cooler, we don't really care about DPA, DPI anymore. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> I'm just going to show that to you very simply. Um, so, I wasn't really thinking about doing a demo right now, but I really think we should. Um, we're going to go into some more detail later. But very simply, what you see here is, is a small app I wrote last night. It's, it's quite simple. But what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to run it in a simulator, and the simulator isn't doing anything anything more fancy than giving me the opportunity of setting multiple. Hello. It's actually not allowing me to do anything, which is rather uncool. Yeah, that's, that's the pitfall of working with better software. What I'm trying to show to you is um, how we can work with different resolutions and different DPI sizes. So what do, what do we do if we have a 10.6 inch screen and a resolution of, I don't know, something with 1024 or something like that, and the same screen size with a much higher resolution, very much like you guys probably know from the iPhone. iPhone 3, very low, low resolution, same screen size as the iPhone 4 with a much higher resolution. Oh my god, this is a nightmare. Hopefully we'll get there at some point. Alright, I'm just skipping this. We have to show this later. No, 
that shouldn't be a problem, but that's all right. Um, let me just jump here. So what, what we can do is, once we have every single item aligned on the grid, what we can do then is we can simply say, um, if we know that a screen 10.6 inch has a resolution of, I don't know, 2,000 by 1,000, and we want every item to be the same size on the same screen size, 10.6 inch, with a resolution of 4,000 by 2,000, we just have to scale everything up by the factor 2, which is rather simple. The only thing is you need to, you need to have the grid embedded into the system, otherwise you can't do it, because the system is the only party that can actually know about the screen resolution for sure, and can know about the DPI scale for sure. And we can do everything live, we can scale live. So that basically means what we have right now is um, on that beamer is a horrible, horrible resolution. But the way this screen looks with all those tiles is the same regardless of resolution. I think I, think I made my point, hopefully. Um, and what we can do as well, we can, we can basically, if we're doing layout, we can put everything every design element on that grid and align it according to the grid, making good design rather easy, making it very easy for, for the designer or the developer to not care about resolutions anymore. Because once you have everything in relative positions, you don't need to, you don't need to, you don't need to care about the absolute positions. The only thing you need to do is you need to care about how the, how the elements flow. I think that's, that's simple enough. Uh, yeah. That's basically about it, and I have a demo for that that is really, really simple. Um, and it's just a web browser, so it's kind of fail-safe. Uh, it's, my, it's my own very small website. Um, it's nothing too fancy, and obviously it's, it's not an app. Um, but what I just want to show to you is how I, I, defined, I defined a content flow. Don't care about the text, don't care about how it's, how it's in German and stuff like that. But I defined how the content flows. I didn't define any sizes. So what I can do is, if someone is resizing the page, I can work with that quite dynamically, and I don't really care about anything. I don't care about the size. If it's going too small, I can even say, you know what, I'm going to jump to one column. That's totally fine, because I'm using a grid. Do you get that? We can do it this quite interactively, so should I lose you at any point or bore you at any point, you can just scream and we'll jump to something else. But the whole point of a grid is that we don't have to care about the resolution, we can just work with anything we got and the content is going to flow in a natural direction I defined early on. So jumping to the next big point, um, because the other big point we have is once we have some proper design and we're supporting, supporting HTML5 and CSS in the best possible way, and we don't really need to care about where our application is going anymore, what we can do is, or what we did is, we integrated JavaScript into the Windows 8 core services. If you think, if you think about Windows development, as Patrick said earlier, usually you would use a compiled language, like C, C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic, stuff like that. And the reason you did that in compiled languages is because you needed some system services in most cases. So if you, think, if you think about all those applications you have today and think about all those applications online that could run on the system, they're not running on the system for multiple reasons. Number one is they're running in a, in a host, an engine, you know, like FireMonkey or whatever people are using. But mostly it's running in a browser. And the second part is because it's running in a host, it's always limited by, by the limitations of the host. And what we did is we basically made the whole system the host. So we have Chakra, our JavaScript engine, integrated into the system. And, ex and here's the cool part. It is exposing every single feature Windows has. Every single API Windows has is exposed to JavaScript by language projection. You don't need to, you don't need to think about the, that language projection in detail, but what that basically means is if someone wrote a driver in C++, you guys can access it from JavaScript. And that means everything a system is usually responsible for, something like um, launching a camera task, you know, just accessing the camera, giving you a camera feed, giving you access to GPS, notifying you when a short text message arrived on the system SIM card, 
stuff like that. You can you can actually you can have event handler for a new text message arrived in JavaScript. And what that means is uh, this beam is horrible. I'm very sorry about that. What what that means is that what, you know, today we still have XAML, our presentation language for C and C++ and C Sharp and Visual Basic. And obviously those guys have access to, to the system services on communication and graphics and everything you have. But the important part is that HTML5 and JavaScript has the same access to native system APIs as the other guys have. Really, the same access to every single system feature. So, let me just jump into... Let me just jump into what that means. Um, so, as you can somehow and very badly see here, uh, this is my installation right now. This is Windows 8 Consumer Preview, so the currently available version of Windows 8, uh, which can be downloaded by you guys as well. And we have multiple applications here that are doing some cool stuff. We have applications here that are doing notifications, um, sending text messages, accessing the camera, stuff like that. And you can't really tell which application is JavaScript and which is not. But, um, for instance, one application I kind of like is, uh, I mean, this is a, a quite popular example, but I really like, I really like Cut the Rope. Um, this is complete HTML5 and G, uh, JavaScript. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, from a developer's point of view, it's nothing too fancy. It's just canvas and some, some power. Um, you know about this. What you probably don't know is how we can, how we can use... Let, let me just get back to the menu. How we can use system services in that application. So what you see right here are charms. Um, this is controlled by the system. And what I can do here, very simply, I can go into the settings. And this JavaScript application notified the system about some settings it has. I can just go into the settings of Cut the Rope. And this is a very simple example, but I can just go into the settings here and play around with some services that the system is offering. Um, the same is true for other applications like, uh, let's go with iCookbook rather simple application as well. Um, iCookbook is right now building an index DB database, HTML5 as well, as you, some of you maybe know. Uh, and it's getting some data about recipes. And the whole point is that because we have so many features available and because we have so many things available, um, a lot of development for HTML5 and JavaScript is way easier than it could be on other platforms. And it's also making development for Windows 8 easier um, as it could be in other languages. So some, things, some of the things I have here um, are controls that are just integrated into the system. So what you can see here, all the things you see are very simple to develop because it's a, it's a ready-made control. So if I go into, let's say, the search menu, which is, by the way, system-wide, system um, and I'm looking for, a, you know, I don't know, chicken. Chicken makes sense. And I send it away. What I have now, I have the system asking my JavaScript application to give me some search results, and I can actually handle that. So, let me go back. So that means instead of... So that, that means instead of putting my own search into my application or onto my web page, I can interact with Windows at that case. So uh, people can profit from that because um, if you once learn how to search, then um, you you are you are able to search in different applications as well, and you can search Windows as well. So there's one experience for search, right? Yeah, sure. Cool. Yep. 
so, so in order to achieve that, what we build up are standard contracts. Um, and those contracts you can bind to, and for example, there's something like share. So maybe one application wants to share stuff with another one. Or maybe if you think about it, if you're a Twitter app, you maybe wanted to Twitter. But if you are something like a document app and you have some great news or you're an RSS reader, then maybe you wanted to profit from the functionality of the Twitter app. And say so you say, hey, give me the information I can send you. And so I send you a quick text message, and then Twitter is, is doing that for, um, is, is more or less the, the Twitter app is then sending it to Twitter, and so you have this interaction between two apps. So um, in order to achieve that, as I said, there are contracts predefined uh, which you can bind to, and it's pretty much like an interface, and then you can implement that into your JavaScript. Yeah, another question. Exactly. So your app app defines what is possible and what not, what you work with and what not. And another question, like the, the, the API you're offering on the on the JavaScript level, uh, the API is it is it like an intermediate layer that is basically transferring the JavaScript API into the common Windows API? Okay, we are coming exactly to that point. So I give up to Felix. <laughs> I love that question because it's brilliant. It's like we bought you. Um, <laughs> no, I, I really do. Um, so usually, what you would usually have is an intermediate layer, exactly. But we don't. What we have is a so-called language projection. And that basically means... Um, wrong button. That basically means that JavaScript is basically a V-table pointer jump. That's the official technical term. But that basically means no intermediate layer. We're going from JavaScript call down to the kernel like really deep down, you, couldn't, you really couldn't go any deeper, and it's doing its stuff there. Some calls are broked, but usually what you have is you, expo you have exposed namespaces, and now that things should be working better, I can just show that to you. Usually you have exposed namespaces, and you find all your APIs there, and then you can just call those and use them like you would use in any, any framework. Think about it like jQuery, just in a way more complex way. Now that we have some code, I can actually show that to you. Um, so what I can do, for instance, something very simple. I'm going to show you something very simple. So this is the application I, I set together this morning and last night. Um, it's my, my own very simple web page. It's just pulling some RSS and it's doing some, um, it's doing some things like showing this grid view. You know, I have this view that is automatically flowing, including a grid, all, the th all those things I told you about before. and. I have an animation coming in, so things I would normally code. Well, those animations are offered by WinJS and offered by the Windows API. So let us just look at the code. Um, so what I'm doing here, two things. Number one, in HTML5, I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just defining things um, using the normal API. So for instance, what we have, what we have over here, don't think, I don't sweat the details. What I have over here is a list view. And what you can see here is it's just a normal div. What, what I did is I gave it a data win control, which, by the way, if you guys know HTML5, data win control, data, you can just set arbitrary controls. Data is something you can define yourself. Um, data win control just tells Windows, by the way, please may, out of this div, make a hugely complex control. In my case, a list view. Could be a rating, could be stars, could be a file picker, could even be a cam camera control. And this is all I have to do. On the other side, if I, want to, if I want to address some exposed APIs, it's very much the same. If you think about I, I gave the example of the animation. This is, this is everything I needed to do to do the animation. I'm just going to resize that. C++, native. But you can your in CSS. Obviously, you can do that. You can also use jQuery. That's totally fine. The whole point is, and this is why I think this is so cool, the whole point is that um, all you need to do, let me just, let me just pull up one other, one other example. Uh, actually. Uh, the column functions on 
It's basically like that. Basically, yeah. You have to think about it like a way more complex jQuery. By the way, you could use jQuery. But whenever. So if you think about jQuery like a framework, you have something behind that is doing stuff for you. Think about that something behind that is doing stuff for you, not as something that is JavaScript, but as the whole Windows stack. So for instance, just one quick example. Um, we have a new object. JavaScript is object-based, uh, prototype-based, and we have a prototype that's called Camera Capture UI. There we are. Uh, and that's the call you would make to ask the Windows Media API to pull up its capture functionality and launch a camera capture UI. So just asking it to use the camera. Yes. Exactly. So the whole point, and the whole point why I'm so excited about this, I joined Microsoft a couple of months ago. I'm actually coming from the other side, the more white side, and I've been doing web development there. And the whole reason I'm so excited about this and the reason I joined Microsoft is because everyone who has a web application or something you, you can see after you put in a web address. Yeah. Everything you can do in JavaScript. Yeah, full text. You can do the whole thing. So basically what you have to think about is once you wrote your Joomla site and you have your templates and everything you have, you can use what you have at this point and you can use the APIs you call at this point, whatever APIs you use, whether it's JSON and JavaScript or whatever. You can use all that stack and use it within an application. And on top of that, you have all that value that is available to real applications. And that value might be Notifications. We can do notifications here, and you can send notifications using JavaScript. Yeah, I hate that question because now the truth is, all I can say right now, and this is always the point where I have to expose myself as a corporate guy, is no comment. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. Well, let me let me let me let me give you a very diplomatic answer. So, we, we put a lot we put in a lot of effort of making sure that Windows 8 isn't bound to a single to a single device experience. I'm um, just giving you one example. We have something that is called MS Pointer. Do you guys know how you have in JavaScript you have that event click and the event tap, which is really cool if you used some earlier jQuery versions or de even developed with some earlier jQuery versions, and you found yourself that your application is not running at all on an iPad, that is because the iPad, and rightly so, is sending not a click event but a touch event. It's totally right. We have something that's called MS Pointer, like a unified, unified event handler for clicks, inputs, connect. It could even be, you know, the connect registering that you're waving your hand. You can ask for that with MS Pointer. Just one quick example. Then we have the grid. Then we have the DPI scaling. So we, we went into some great detail of making sure that applications run regardless of the device. So now that I restarted, as you guys saw a minute ago, I can come back to, I can give you that promise, promise demo about the DPI thing. And I'm using my own application as well. Um, again, it's a really simple application, as I told. No, right, no. At the moment. Yeah. Yes. Now the tab tablet is Windows 8. Um, we, yeah, so basically, here's, here's the clue. You can install Windows 8 on x, x86, 64, and on ARM devices. Most mobile phones today are ARM. <laughs> All right, so this is a simulator. And I don't know if you can see that quite clearly. Yes. Why not? Okay. 
Well, here's the actual point is, if your website is not interesting enough to make an app out of it, you shouldn't. Yes. I think everyone in this room knows at least one website that should be an app. Right? Facebook, Twitter, Google, Bing, Google Docs, Office 365. We have examples, right? We have multiple examples. Um, all what we're saying is, we're not saying you should make your website into an app. What I'm saying is, and I'm actually begging you, is please don't make your shitty websites into shitty apps. <laughs> please don't. Because you won't pass certification, you won't even get your app into any, any Windows device. But if you guys have great, great mobile websites and great normal websites, you could and should make those into an app. Yes, please. Well, the real power from my point of view is that you guys all have a toolkit. And if you're somewhat like me, your toolkit is not C++. Your toolkit is using CSS, using HTML5, using JavaScript, um, knowing a, way, a thing or two about building, building um, quite powerful JavaScript objects, doing some proper templating. If you have that toolkit, you're ready to build proper applications. And I, I really mean proper. We have one example out there uh, that's in development right now, which is a so-called high-security banking app. It's a full JavaScript app doing financial transactions. That's totally possible with the toolkit you have today. That's the real power. Um, obviously, for you guys, it comes down to what you're doing. So if I'm talking to, if I'm talking to guys who are doing most the agency business, they're going crazy because they can basically build an app and a website and can do it on the fly, you know. If you're doing a website and you're doing an app early on, you can easily do both with little more time, but you can build two things. Offline scenarios, maybe where your app has to be responsive, even if you fly, even if you are around an airplane or something like that. Then I think um, this is this is a great opportunity to do to go for that. You can seem very easily migrate the website into the Windows stuff, and then you just say, okay, I also wanted to support search. I also want to do camera. Maybe I want to interact with Twitter, but not with Facebook. It's up to you. What do you do? Yep. Yeah, question. Yeah, um, so we have a marketplace actually right now, um, and there are a lot of apps available. I think it's something about uh, 70 apps, something like this, um, which are building on top of the customer preview. So you can, um, if you download the consumer preview of Windows 8, you get also access to the to the store. So the the thing behind the store is, um, and we didn't talk much about it, um, but. The, the real issue here is we wanted to have um, the design language here set a little bit. There are exceptions for games, something like that, but it's really about the Metro thing and, and all those rectangles and, as we said, the, the flow of the content and put the content first. And so what those guys are doing is just checking um, that your app is is in that context, so you have your user experience, as well as that um, there's a technical review and then they say, okay, check, you're allowed to go to the store and then you're available. Yeah. Yeah, corporate that Since since Microsoft Ha. Huh. It could be No, I can give you I can give you a very pre precise and honest answer to that. Microsoft is doing its business with enterprise customers. Enterprise customers have the ability to basically create their own shops. All right? 
Then we have consumer. Consumers will be able to get applications only in the normal store. Because for that reason, we're not like the Android store. We won't have any malware. Anything that goes onto a consumer device is checked by a Microsoft engineer beforehand. So Indeed. Like Pardon? Like, like Apple do. Yeah, like Apple. Yeah. On the enterprise, on the enterprise story, enterprise is able to create their own stores and not go through any certification. But obviously, they need to prep the devices, and it's going to be enterprise scale. This is also related to some service stuff, yeah. But you can do as enterprise. I don't show. Yeah, there's another question. Um, as, someone, as someone who's speaking next week with a guy from Adobe on stage about PhoneGap, <laughs> um, I know some of the problems around PhoneGap, especially in the Apple world. Um, maybe one thing I can say about this is our certification is by, by a very large margin not as harsh as other certifications. Well, 50 would be enterprise. Now, let's say four. Right, four. How we do it four? I need to get up to the four uh, windows, like devices. Uh, there are four engineers in the factory who need them. That's it. How can I get them? Just four. Yeah. Well, the most, the most simple solution would be to install a developer license, from my point of view. All right, but let's, get, let's get it straight here. Let's get it straight, all right? Consumer, so the normal guy out there, won't be able to install anything else apart from the Windows marketplace. Enterprise will be able to do so on defined machines using Windows services. In the middle, and that's interesting where you, put, where you would put it, if you have 50 devices, that's totally enterprise. If you have four, why not just use a developer license? And I don't know if you guys have any experience with the way you develop. Obviously, if you develop and you saw me deploying stuff right now and installing an application right now, I'm, have, I, I'm using a developer license. So if you're installing on just three machines, then just put a developer license on any of that machine. Apart from that, and that's actually the middle ground, um, what's totally fine by us, install a, you know, put an application in the App Store, that's doing nothing but showing a huge, huge login screen. You can even use Active Directory. <laughs> so, I mean, just be, we, we can have an honest discussion about that. That would actually interest me. What would be the best solution for a two person operation? I didn't really catch that. Yeah, and that's working out great. <laughs> well, you can you can just use a developer license, which is obviously the simplest way. It, Developer license means that you can deploy any application to any source code you have. And you can install any application you have. Right now it's free. Right now it's free. But I mean, let's, go, let's get something straight here. If you're asking, how can I get around certification? How can I install my application without anyone checking it? Then the decisive answer is no, you can't. And that's a good reason for it. And I will, I will defend that reason. Yes, I'm, I'm not really coming from Android. I'm coming from the other side. Um, but I'm, I'm very profoundly saying that it's not clever to allow people 
to just install source code as they're going along. It's just not a clever way of doing it. The Appster model proved to be very successful and quite intelligent, to be honest. What do you mean by public? Okay, so let me let me rephrase the question. If no one could find your application, would it still be public to you? If they need a key to see your application. You can do hidden applications, as you could always with Microsoft, which you guys probably don't know, but you can do hidden applications. So you need like like a very long key URL to get to that application. But it's still going to be certified by Microsoft engineers. Because I feel like what you're asking for is just not possible with an App Store model at all. So you just want to install. So you're asking for, I'm going into, into the store, buying a device, and just installing everything on it. That's what you're asking for, right? That's not going to happen. Because. Then go for the enterprise model. No, but then go for the enterprise model. Yes, small companies. Then go for enterprise model. Then go for the enterprise model. We have a whole model set up for exactly that situation. There's probably going to be some pricing there, yes. Obviously. I mean, the op I mean, I don't, I don't know if I surprise you guys, but Microsoft is making money. That's the business we're in. We're not giving away stuff for free, right? I mean, Except that shouldn't surprise you. Yeah. Except everything you saw today, that's free. But apart from that, I think it's not necessarily uh, the difference between making money or not making money. Like with the human community, is very common that. Yes. But, but once you shift away from the, the responsibility thing, and you actually say out loud, like, well, you can install this app, but without our consent, and, well, you are solely responsible if, if it crashes your whole machine or whatever, um, the terms and conditions could be changed just to, to facilitate that. Then actually, Microsoft is not responsible anymore for, well, doing anything with the app. I know what you're hinting at, and... To be quite honest, we have we have a solution for that. We have developer license, which, by the way, are free right now. Um, we have the enterprise model. I, I seem like when I'm saying enterprise, you guys think, I don't know, the U.S. Navy. If I'm saying enterprise, I mean anything other than the end user. So it's not going to be like 20 billion gazillion dollars. Um, I'm just saying, you know, like Windows Home Edition and Windows Professional. You know, it's not like yeah, but you get what I mean. You get what I mean. Um, so for exactly that situation you have, we have the ability to do... Oh, all right. <laughs> now, I was just worried that we're out of time. Um, for exactly for that situation, we have the enterprise store, so the solution for people to install applications themselves. Obviously, you need, you need to set like policies on the machine, so you need like managed IT. But you can do that yourself. If you want to do that for two machines, I think it's silly, and you should just use a developer license. But if you want to, go ahead. 
and in between, we have the ability of having hidden applications. We have public law enforcement using our applications, using the hidden model right now. Um, it's working totally fine. I just want to show you, before I take the next question, because it was so difficult to get this alpha thing running, um, I just want to show you. This is the silly application I built a couple of minutes ago. Um, and I have 10.6 inch simulated by uh, full HD. If I'm going to, down to not HD, this, in this case 1366 by 768, it's going to flicker for a minute because it's a simulator. But as you will see, it's rearranging itself, it's adjusting the DPI scale, it's adjusting the scale of everything, and it's looking the same regardless of resolution. That's just what I wanted to show. So, next question, please. <laughs> Yes. Um, he can just he can keep he can keep using C sharp, and he can keep using something we call .NET for Windows Metro. But I mean that's boring. That's what we did always. You can you, Windows is a huge legacy and heavily supported system and ecosystem. Everything you wrote years ago is still running today. It's the same for Windows and Windows 8. But what's even more cooler? Your friend can write something in C sharp and C plus plus, and you can use it from JavaScript. Yes, including variables and methods. And I think you have an example for that. I have an example for that because I'm glad you brought it up. Um, what I have here is, is the C++ application calculating prime numbers as well as... Um, so this is C++, right? Nobody likes it and um, whatever. And so you mentioned C Sharp earlier. Yeah, we have C Sharp as well. And those are producing DLL stuff, um, Windows stuff, where you can bind to, so this could be a text. And um, for the slide, please. What we have here is a JavaScript um, application which has some interesting CSS because you will see a CSS animation right now if you study the application, as well as um, a simple, very, very simple um, stuff here in order where we, where we load this kind of stuff. So, which means you can call the that stuff your friend wrote, you can integrate it into your app, and all you do is DUI, for example, and then you can run this stuff. Before you deploy that, can you, can you stop there for a minute and just scroll down? Because I think that's really the cool part. Uh, in the code, please. In the code? Yes. So, some things here you probably know. Um, if you think about it, we have something, something like there. Document.getElementById, CSPrimes, HTML 5 uh, stuff like that. You know that, right? But do you see the lines above that? While CSPrime compute, that is coming directly out of C++. Yeah. And they're not being they're not being translated, they're not being abstracted, it's a direct call. So you can interact with the source code of your friend, you can put things together, or maybe you can use other bookmakers, whatever you like. So you have a, a pretty, pretty powerful line here. You're a JavaScript developer, maybe you wanted to to come back to your scenario. What about thinking about um, I have a guy who is writing sales, hardware, whatever. And here's a driver for this very special printer or something like that. Okay, so what your chances are very good that you wrote and he wrote some driver for C++, so it's running on Windows, it's running on some other machines. And what you can do is take this, this, this library and just call it exactly from a JavaScript. And that is the, the new power you have with, with that capability. But I just want to start that application because I mean, very cool. So and it, it warned me about the C++ warning. Oh, you're doing C++. Be careful. No, C++ code is dangerous. And you start using that object in your network. Why not? Why not? But you can do it. Thank you. We totally do that. So since we got already the five minute thing and we're still building, I'm just going to start my wrap up. Yeah. Uh, because we were jumping back and forth, but that was kind of the concept of the session in the going into the questions you guys have. So the key messages I would like to get across are, number one, 
you can do HTML5 and JavaScript, and you can use the Windows API and whatever you put into the Windows API. That means if you guys are building websites and you think that website could be an application, you don't need to write an application in some compiled language. You can just use the tools you have. And in many cases, you can use the source code you use on your sites. So speaking from a Joomla perspective, if you have a, if, you know, if you build a pretty powerful template, there's no reason not to use the HTML5 code to write a template with. If you have some JavaScript going on doing some animations on your website, there's no reason not to just use that JavaScript. Um, the third part is it's freaking fast. So whatever you're doing on your website is probably going to run way faster on Windows 8, um, just because it's faster. And the fourth point I didn't mention yet, your websites can be pinned as an application. It's not like a serious application, it's more like iPad is doing, but you can send notifications to your website, and your website can, via meta tag, tell Windows 8, by the way, I have an app. And as soon as the user goes to your website, there's going to be like a small bar where you can jump directly to the app. That are the four key messages, and now I'm giving over to Patrick sharing how to use C++ from. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah I, I've already done that. So um, just call it C++. What you can do here is, is start, and you have the, the three bibliotheques. Everybody's calculating prime numbers. Well, um, if, if we just um, cut the connection, you will see that um, JavaScript is seriously going to Wikipedia and downloading all the, the prime numbers because it's faster. And but anyways. Um, so what I wanted to show is that you have this interaction, and we're calling C++ C sharp. Yeah, you cannot see it. it. It's it's a matrix effect, but it's okay. If somebody wants to see a CSS3 animation, we can show you um, after the talk. It's really ugly. It shouldn't look. Yeah, it's but but it's an animation still. Um, and. Um, one more thing, I think. Um, if, if you guys want to know more now um, and go to, to develop um, or, or maybe want to have a look and download um, the CTP stuff in this. So there's, there's three links you want to recommend to you, I think. Yeah, that's maybe the other part. All development tools are for free, including Yay. So um, you go to dev.windows.com if you're if you're a developer, then you check it out. You go to the JavaScript um, section and you can get more information about it. Um, then there are some design guidelines, as we mentioned earlier. Um, you can check them out on design.windows.com. And if you guys are staying in Berlin the next few weeks, I don't know, um, we are there at May and June, and um, what we are having is something like a co-work space. So you can come and um, you can check it out and develop your own app if you like to.